So in this video, I'm going to give a, a quick overview of the quests uh, that have been around for uh, you know, discerning the historical Jesus. And so these quests kind of arose out of a, a recognition that the Jesus who uh, actually existed uh, in history uh, is probably quite different uh, than the Jesus that came to be worshipped uh, by, uh, by the church so that um, uh, things that were attributed to Jesus, both by within the gospel themselves and then later on by the church in terms of uh, his own consciousness and what he thought he, he was accomplishing, uh, there grew this idea that, that they were uh, different. Uh, so today in historical Jesus studies, there's a wide a variety of positions that scholars hold. Some uh, who see uh, that the um, a presentation of Jesus in the Gospels uh, is um, highly credible um, and that um, uh, having an assumption of the belief in miracles uh, that that makes uh, the Gospels um, you know quite quite credible um, uh, so that the things that Jesus did that were miraculous could occur uh, for those that are more skeptical of of whether or not miracles can occur or simply believe that they cannot occur, uh, then they try to account for the development of the stories and um, uh, activities uh, about Jesus that were invented uh, by the gospel authors and by the early church and what you know Jesus himself thought about his own uh, missions and aims. So here we're just going to quickly review uh, uh, some of the major moments in the different quests uh, for the uh, historical Jesus. So really the original uh, rejections uh, against obtaining historical verification of Jesus' words and deeds from the Gospels. Um, so first, scholars began to think it's impossible to get impartial historical, uh, historical accuracy from sources that they thought were so clearly biased. So can you really trust the Gospel authors when all of them are written by Christians and all, all of them have a positive view of Jesus and want to present a positive view of Jesus, uh, they, you know, all the authors worship Jesus uh, as the Son of God. And so, um, you know, can these sources really be trusted when they have this kind of a bias? Also, it is, uh, it, uh, it is either historically uh, disrespectful or contrary to the nature of faith uh, to seek answers to our questions uh, from sources that are answering different ones. So uh, they thought, you know, these documents were written in a particular time uh, with a particular faith. Um, and um, what we're doing today when we read the Gospels are we're, we have our own kind of faith and we have our own kind of answers and our, our questions to really to understand about our own life and our own cultural context. And uh, these are different than what the uh, original authors were seeking to, to answer, or at least that's part of the skepticism, is that they were uh, quite different than what the original authors were trying to answer. Uh, so it's impossible to extract um, from uh, the Gospels historically verifiable material because Jesus um, was not a normal person. So, um, you know, some will re resist the idea that you can't really use the gospel text this way um, because Jesus was not like any other kind of um, historical figure. Um, it's certainly with the idea of you know, Jesus is this um, person sent by God and um, is able to empower to perform different miracles. That's quite different than most people. Uh, and so uh, if these sources were written in, in light of that, you can't really treat these Gospels in ways um, as you would other people. So the original quest uh, for this really, we can go back to uh, Herman uh, Ramirez. Um, and so he was professor of Oriental Languages in Hamburg, Germany, and uh, he's influenced particularly by English deism. So just a reminder about deism. So that's this idea that 
uh, God creates the world and then just kind of leaves the world uh, to its own devices and that God's not going to intervene. So, you know, they're not going to be miracles. There's not going to be a resurrection. There's not going to be, you know, someone dying for our sins. I mean, God is not interested in doing anything for, for humans. And so if that's your perspective, uh, then, and you want to, in a sense, kind of salvage Jesus out of the Gospels for contemporary life, but you want to set aside, as it were, the miraculous uh, a aspects. Um, that's what um, Ramirez is trying to do. So there are three ma major positions Ramirez had. First of all, to distinguish uh, between the preaching that Jesus himself did uh, and the apostles' faith in Jesus as Christ. So for Ramirez, they, these were two different things. Jesus was about preaching one thing, but after his death, his um, followers um, um, see Jesus or think about Jesus, revere Jesus as the Christ, and then they begin to develop their faith uh, around their uh, conceptions of him. Jesus' preaching... Um, so Ramirez uh, taught must be understood uh, only from the context of the, Jew, the Jewish context. Uh, so in other words, instead of thinking about Jesus' preaching as um, something that addresses our faith or our interest, um, what, was, what did his words and teachings mean in that context? So Jesus was both a prophetic and an apocalyptic figure who preached a political message of revolution, so according to Ramirez. Um, the disciples of Jesus uh, saved his reputation uh, by stealing his body uh, and proclaiming his resurrection after the body could no longer be identified. So this is his belief what happened uh, to the body. So uh, that's certainly one of the things that has to be accounted for. And of course, this idea is, is hinted at, or at least uh, thought about, at least kind of rejected in, in Matthew's gospel. Uh, why they want to put a soldier is that you know, the disciples will come and, and take his body. So Ramirez thinks that's actually what did happen. Um, another person uh, in the quest was uh, David Friedrich Strauss, um, and uh, he's a student of uh, both Hegel and Bauer, um, and, uh, but he was more influenced by the work of Schleiermacher. And so he wrote uh, A Life of Jesus, uh, incorrectly claiming uh, that it represented Hegelian thought. So, even though he was a student of Hegel, um, so in Hegelian thought, there is a thesis and antithesis uh, that conflict with each other and out of which arises a, an antithesis. And so, Jesus is presented kind of in this uh, a model, or at least the model that. Um, Strauss thought represented uh, Hegelian thought. So it's rejected the approaches of both uh, supernaturalism uh, and naturalism as methods of interpreting the gospel. So by supernaturalism, referring to okay, miracles can occur, Jesus did miracles, there are these supernatural things that take place, and naturalism was sought to explain, well, how could Jesus do some of these things? How was it that you know, it looked like he walked on water. Well, you know, Jesus knew where, you know, there was shallow land and he happened to walk on that part of the water and the disciples saw him and thought he was um, walking on, on deep water, but he actually, he's just walking on very shallow land. Or, you know, Jesus says something to, to someone um, to arise, but really they, they thought they were dead, but they really weren't dead. And so Jesus revived them. Uh, so these that's a more kind of natural, approach to interpreting uh, what took place, what's behind uh, the uh, gospel narratives. So instead of doing either one of these, he interprets the gospels in favor as interpreting events, as myths. So in other words, that the all, uh, these authors create these stories, uh, and these stories represent kind of understandings of what God does in the world, um, that Jesus these stories about Jesus uh, reflect their belief of what God can do uh, in the world, not whether or not they actually really occurred in Jesus' life. Uh, he's one as well who distinguished John from the synoptics. Of course, it's, you know, throughout church history, John has always been, the Gospel of John has always seemed different than uh, the synoptic, but 
um, he distinguished John from the Synoptic as a less historically trustworthy source. source. So John is much more the theological. Um, he gets away from a number of things uh, that seem to be common amongst the three Gospels and seeing that these three other three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, as uh, sources collectively together, uh, saying the, some of the same things about what Jesus uh, said and did, although certainly th there are differences. But John is just on a completely different uh, level and with certainly much more uh, upfront uh, interest in creating faith. Uh, he believed that Matthew and Luke were the earliest Gospels and that Mark abridged them. This is what is known as the Griesbach uh, hypothesis. So Matthew and Luke are uh, predate Mark. Uh, so in terms of the liberal quest, you have such representatives as Heinrich uh, Julius Holtzman. Uh, he supported the two source theory of, of Mark and Q, and these are the sources that Matthew and Luke used. Uh, Jesus' messianic consciousness formed in Galilee, uh, but was revealed in Caesarea uh, Philippi. So in other words, when did Jesus think he was the Messiah? At what point did he think he was the Messiah? So for Holtzman, he, he came to develop this idea while he was in Galilee, and then he reveals his understanding of himself in Caesarea Philippi. Uh, Richshaw, uh, Albert Richshaw, 1822-1889, uh, uh, separated historical and theological inquiry so that a person could do historical in inquiry on the Gospels without having to answer theological questions about Jesus and, uh, and faith and what God is you know, doing in the world. So you can separate those two. The kingdom of God should be understood as God's uh, ethical lordship over the world through the redeemed. So um, kind of reevaluating, as it were, this language that Jesus used about kingdom of God and um, still, in a sense, salvaging, as it were, this language, um, you know, for contemporary faith. Uh, but this is not a historical inquiry. This is something that's valuable for theological, today's theological concerns. So um, God's ethical lordship over the, over the world through the redeemed, how, the, how people today might, might live. So kingdom of God now is, can be understood separately from a historical in, inquiry of what Jesus may have meant by kingdom of God. Uh, Adolf Harnack. Uh, developed a Christology uh, based on Q. Uh, so this is this uh, uh, idea that um, there was material that was used by Matthew and Luke, a source, whether it was in written form or an oral form, uh, and that there is a Christology within this a source, and that this may be one of the earliest Christology, a Christology, that a, a primitive Christology of the uh, early Jesus followers, the Jesus movement, um, before you get Mark, Matthew, uh, Luke, or, or maybe even before Paul. Uh, this is an attempt that's also made by Burton Mack in his uh, Lost Gospel. The Lost Gospel. Uh, Johannes Weiss, uh, he wrote to Jesus' proclamation of the kingdom of God. Uh, and for him, Jesus' teaching the kingdom was eschatological. So this is a kind of reaction against those who want to see the kingdom of God uh, Jesus' teaching of God is much more kind of um, universal um, and uh, something that can be detached from its uh, Jewish context. So um, he sees this as you, you've got to appreciate that Jesus, in his historical context, um, you know, thought like an eschatological prophet or an eschatological spokesperson. Uh, William Breda. Uh, 1859 to 1906. Uh, he's the one responsible for developing the concept of the messianic secret and just needs to be kind of clear what that messianic secret is. That It's the theory that Mark invented the idea that Jesus kept his messianic identity a secret to everyone except his disciples. Sometimes people think the messianic secret is Jesus kept his messianic identity a secret. It's not that Jesus did, 
is that Mark invented the idea that Jesus uh, kept that identity a secret. So uh, Rada is responsible for that. He sees that you can detect in Mark tensions um, uh, with what he was trying to do. He's not consistent in, in dealing with that, but um, he, that's why he thinks you can be able to sort out where Mark has come in and edited his source and that, you know, Mark himself has a theology. So there were people who thought, well, Matthew is more theological and Luke is more theological and Mark is just much more uh, reliable source uh, and that that can be read. It's less theological. And Rada was coming around and saying, no, um, Mark also has a, a theology and this is part of what his theology is. Uh, the Gospels then are primary sources, uh, not for uh, the life of Christ, but the beliefs of the evangelist and their communities. And that too was a very important um, position to take and has been quite influential within um, gospel studies to think about authors who are writing for their communities and who are engaging with their communities and their situations and so very um, frequently in gospel studies, you'll hear about scholars talk about a Markan community or a Matthean community or Lucan community. So uh, Rada was one of the early ones who uh, suggested this or argued for this. Uh, Jesus was, for Rada, a, a Galilean teacher uh, or prophet who did do remarkable things, it's not, but not necessarily miraculous, but he was eventually uh, executed. First part of the, the weakness of all this is you still have to argue or explain uh, why a person who does remarkable things uh, gets executed. And so, um, in what sense is just doing remarkable things a threat to the Roman Roman government? Uh, I guess you have to somehow or another see that these remarkable things uh, made people believe Jesus was something that. The, the Romans thought could be dangerous, whether or not Jesus himself taught that he was something that was a threat to the Romans. Uh, of one of the big names uh, in the original quest is, of course, the work of Albert Schweitzer, a uh, fascinating uh, individual himself and a life, um, but um, he was the one responsible for the quest of the historical Jesus. Um, he says three crises uh, were faced by previous studies. You had Strauss, which had either a purely historical or supernatural. Uh, you had the Holtzman, either the Synoptics or John. And you had Breda, which was either eschatological or non-eschatological. So, um, so this is what before Schweitzer, they're primarily uh, were facing. So for Schweitzer, though, Jesus needs to be understood within the context of uh, apocalyptic Judaism, so that Jesus was an apocalyptic Jew. He believed, uh, Jesus believed he was the Messiah and thought God would intervene in his lifetime to bring um, about the kingdom. But uh, Jesus fails. In other words, Jesus cry on the cross, uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, is where Jesus comes to realize that God is not going to rescue him. And um, so, um, but this is what he was, honestly. He did think that the kingdom of God was at hand. He did think that the kingdom of God would come soon, um, but it didn't, it didn't happen. But uh, even though Jesus failed, uh, that doesn't mean that he is not helpful to us uh, in terms of living our lives and constructing a life uh, today, because in that sense, Jesus can come to us as one unknown. Um, and so interacting with this one who is unknown, who is a, a mystery, uh, can lead us to a particular kind of, of life of service. And so that's what Schweitzer does. He, he was a medical doctor as well and uh, gave his uh, life basically in the service tending to the needs of people uh, in Africa. And so um, it's Schweitzer is a very interesting um, person for not only the life that he lived, but also the kind of Jesus that he presents and the attacks that he made, uh, which really did uh, set historical Jesus 
uh, studies in a, a fresh new uh, direction. Then there came a period of what we can call the, the no quest. Um, the person most associated with this is Rudolf Bultmann. Uh, so for Bultmann, the personality of the historical Jesus cannot be discovered. Uh, and really, whatever Jesus was is really unnecessary for theology today. Uh, the gospel stories about Jesus are faith statements. So again, this kind of concept of myths. And they reflect Christian belief in the, the risen Christ. They don't really reflect uh, actual things that occurred um, in Jesus' life. So to get back to any sayings of Jesus, one has to what he called demythologize the gospel. So in other words, they are myths. Uh, we have these things that are put in there by people of faith, by followers of Jesus. And so the historical scholar today needs to try and strip back those things that were attached to Jesus' sayings, Jesus' activities, so that you can get back to something that he did say. Uh, so this, uh, but he's, he's quite uh, skeptical uh, of what we're able to get back, although, you know, he did um, write the synoptic traditions. Um, he thought there could be ways and methods in terms of getting back to sayings of Jesus. But um, that much of the work that was being done in the historical Jesus for the purposes of creating a kind of new faith or a new understanding that stands opposed to what the church was saying or what many churches were saying about Christ, um, he didn't think that was uh, uh, quite necessary. Uh, the Jesus for today's theology uh, is not preaching the end of the world, but it is calling for a a decision, a yes, as it were. Um, you know, how does one live in confidence uh, today? How does uh, one live in accepting challenges and responsibilities today? So that's what uh, what the, the Jesus that is needed for today it wasn't the what the Jesus was doing in in his day, or what his earliest followers thought necessarily he was uh, about. But that's probably what we need today, or at least that's what Boltman thought uh, we needed today. So you can see that what happens is uh, with the no quest period, that they become quite skeptical. Scholars can skeptical about finding historical Jesus. Now we've already talked about some of the skepticisms in the earlier uh, period um, uh, with uh, the skepticisms that arise with how the Gospels were generally read. But some other uh, skepticisms arose during this no quest period. Uh, one, basically non-Christian sources are, are largely silent about Jesus. So if there really was a Jesus, why, why, why don't we have more uh, non-Christian sources that are about Jesus? Uh, Paul's Christ is more of a mythical being rather than this person who lived and acted and did certain things. So of course, there is this focus on uh, a death that occurred, um, but for Paul... It's not so much about what Jesus said and did, his teachings, his life, his ministry. Um, those aren't nearly as relevant as this uh, activity of dying. And then in Paul's myth, uh, it is this uh, raising from the dead and then uh, um, being becoming the Lord and then uh, recognizing his lordship as a part of Christian faith. Uh, the Johannine picture of Christ is so different from the synoptic one. So again, this is the uh, idea that we'd seen earlier on that you just can't trust John as a historical source. Uh, Easter faith, uh, that is the faith in the resurrection of Jesus, then reshaped pre-Easter traditions. So in other words, there were things that the disciples remembered that Jesus said um, uh, and repeated what Jesus said before he was executed. But after they came to believe he was risen from the dead, they looked back at that, those teachings, those traditions, those memories, and they reshaped them so that they aligned or led to that Easter faith. Uh, the synoptics were written a long time uh, after the events that they report. So if you're thinking of Mark in the 60s or Matthew, Luke in the 70s and 80s, and John, you know, possibly in the 90s, um, if not 
longer. Um, so these are at least 30 decades after the events of Jesus' life in the early 30s. Uh, the traditions about Jesus are, are more interested in the present than the past. So in other words, they're telling these stories uh, so that they can address community tradition, community interests, community concerns, community questions, rather than kind of getting back to what it is we can actually know uh, took place. Christian communities' uh, needs reshape the traditions. So the kind of questions that they were talking about, they would go back to these traditions and shape them in such a way so that they could answer questions. An example might be in the Mark, the Gospel of Mark chapter 7, where we have the tradition about Jesus' engagement with uh, Pharisees about why his disciples don't wash their hands in Mark 7. Um, and Jesus' teaching, it's not you know, what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out that defiles them. And then you have a Mark and uh, you know, commentary on this. Thus he declared all foods clean. So in other words, if within the community there are these questions about can Christians eat certain foods or not. Um, this tradition then uh, was reshaped so that it could be used to basically say, no, uh, Christians can eat all foods. Jesus has declared all foods clean. Uh, the Old Testament was used to shape the traditions about Jesus, so we very oftentimes see uh, scriptures that are attached to Jesus' traditions. Uh, sometimes, you know, Jesus himself, um, you know, in the narrative, refers to passages of scripture from the Old Testament. Uh, others would say, well, uh, something is told, let's say the Passion Week, uh, things are told uh, about what happened to Jesus, knowing certain Old Testament scriptures so that Jesus' actions uh, can look like they are some type of fulfillment of an Old Testament. So in other words, this, you know, someone might say, well, I really believe that, um, you know, Jesus is the Messiah because look at how many prophecies fulfilled. Well, you know, from this perspective, well, the prophecies are attached um, and the prophecies then are used to form what Jesus uh, does. So they're not really fulfilling them. They're being used to, they're being used to construct what Jesus did. Uh, sometimes as well as skepticals that because Jesus' sayings were placed in forms uh, that were created by the disciples. So in other words, you have some Jesus doing things, but because you share this information in specific forms, in order to share them in these forms, you leave out things or you add things in order to make it fit a form. Uh, and this was done in such a way that uh, it's impossible uh, to distinguish between authentic and secondary traditions because they're so inter intertwined. So uh, it's impossible then to separate what the historical Jesus said from what Christian prophets would say in the name of the exalted Christ. So it's, you know, it, so it's this idea that in the early church, there were these people who were prophets, and they would come in, and they says, thus says the Lord, uh, and they would give a saying. Well, someone would hear what that Christian prophet said, thus says the Lord, and then would attribute that saying to a historical Jesus. In other words, Jesus has said, not what the exalted Lord is communicating to the prophet, but that the Jesus who existed before his execution, one time said this. And so then a narrative gets created to provide a context for the saying. So, so the skepticism is you can't separate this. We don't know what Jesus actually really said because these sayings could have come from these Christian prophets who were claiming that the risen Lord was speaking to them. Uh, ancient beliefs and miracles then as well transformed historical recollections of Jesus' deeds. And so um, for these skeptics, you can't believe in miracles, but these people did. And because they believed in miracles, uh, as they thought about Jesus, uh, you know, who, who had a crowd and these crowds followed him because not only did he teach certain things, but he did certain things. And what kind of things would Jesus have done that would have attracted their attention, that would have given justification for um the authority of his teachings, and so miracles then are attributed to Jesus, um, or are the miraculous is used to describe what it is that uh, Jesus did that you know impressed people.
mythical motives, uh, transformed historical recollections of Jesus' uh, experiences. Uh, so um, these things began to be used to talk about his birth, how he was bo uh, born, uh, his temptation, um, transfiguration, resurrection. These would be mythical, um, you know, because the people who told these stories believed that God intervened or interacted with the world, uh, which the skeptics do do not uh, believe. And so because they believe these things, they then attribute these kinds of activities uh, to Jesus' life. Uh, and the methodology of historical Jesus' research is unreliable. Uh, for example, the authenticity based on the criterion of difference uh, would be overturned by new discoveries. So the uh, criterion of difference uh, is um, if there is um, some type of, of difference that takes place in um, what Jesus says and what we might know about that historical context. Um, and then we discount that as a authentic saying of Jesus because it's different from what we know of that context. Once we discover something new that gives us a new insight to that context, then we might be able to say, well, that saying of Jesus could have existed at, at that time. So um, that methodology is open to changes in other words, it's not very secure if new discoveries can continue to undercut decisions or conclusions that's based on that methodology. Uh, then there is a, a new quest. The new quest of Jesus, uh, historical Jesus, really came about through Kazeman, uh, particularly his uh, 1953 paper, The Problem of the Historical Jesus, launched the new quest. Kazeman argued that if Jesus was not rooted in history, especially for theological purposes, uh, then he could be used as a basis for any kind of theological or political agenda. Um, so um, just kind of note the date of the paper. The paper was in 1953, so this is after World War II, so this is after periods of Nazis. Of course, the Nazis had their own Jesus, and of course their Jesus was anti-Semitic. Um, and so someone like Kazeman that that's not a historical Jesus. You shouldn't be using, you know, that uh, that Jesus for the basis for the things that you have have done, or the things that you might want to uh, proclaim about Jesus. Your Jesus should be rooted in history, and so and it was you know kind of recognized, accepted. Yeah, you you've got to have a real Jesus, something in history that we can say. You can't just have um, a, a Jesus that you can just create out of your own uh, ideas detached from history. So, uh, for, so for him, you've got to root it in, him in history. His focus was not so much on a biography of Jesus, but on his preaching of a realized kingdom of God and a call for freedom. So this idea of the kingdom of God brings about uh, freedom. And what would that freedom uh, look like? And what would that freedom mean today? So for Kaysman, you can... There can be differences between the cultural context or preaching of Jesus for today as it was in, in distinction to back then, um, but there is something historical about the concept of a realized kingdom of God that goes back to Jesus and can be the foundation source for the proclamation of, of Jesus today. Uh, and he's the one who kind of responsible for the criterion of double dissimilarity uh, for authenticating uh, Jesus's sayings. So in a different podcast, I'll talk about these uh, criterion of authenticity uh, later. But anyway, he's the one responsible for double dissimilarity. Um, so uh, some of the presuppositions of the new quest is the presuppositions that the earthly Jesus and the exalted Christ are both presupposed in the earliest Christian sources. So it's not just that the Gospels only have what it is that they want their exalted Christ to say for their faith, but there is something of 
this earthly Jesus or the historical Jesus that's there. Uh, a critically assumed minimum of authentic Jesus tra tradition can be found based on the criterion of difference or the criterion of dissimilarity. Uh, historical support for the kerygma of Christ is implicit, that is the preaching uh, of Christ, is implicit in Jesus' conduct and proclamation. So what it is the earliest Christians proclaimed about Jesus uh, is there in what Jesus did and in what Jesus proclaimed, regardless of whether or not Jesus used Christological titles, whether or not Jesus used phrases like Son of Man, like Messiah, like Son of God. Uh, even if we say that Jesus didn't use these, these titles, uh, Jesus' actions and some of the things that Jesus said is the reason why or is behind um, the claim uh, of him as the Christ. Uh, and so for the new quest, only orthodox sources is, are reliable. So not only, only words, the biblical sources, the New Testament sources, or the gospel sources uh, are used. You shouldn't be using um, non-canonical or non-biblical sources to get back to the earthly Jesus or the historical Jesus. Then after a while, we get something that's called the third quest. Um, so, of course, we had Schweitzer was the original. Then you had this next one with Kazeman, and now we have kind of a third wave. Uh, and so this third quest is represented by people like E.P. Sanders, his important work, Jesus and Judaism. Um, a, a Jew raised by uh, Christians who reclaim his Jewish uh, um, uh, ancestry or heritage, uh, Geza Vermesh, uh, Robert Funk, who is often who's associated with um, the uh, work that you know was done with the, the Jesus Seminar, John Dominic Crossan, Marcus Borg, N.T. Wright. So these are people associated with the Third Quest. So some of the presuppositions of the Third Quest is uh, Jesus was a Jew. Everyone needs to accept that. You can't make Jesus into anything else. They were earthly Jews and anything else but a Jew. Uh, but you do ask the question, what kind of Jews? There are different views about the variety of Jews that existed uh, in the first century and trying to more closely place Jesus into one particular uh, type of Jew. Uh, there is an interest in sociological factors, so such as millennial uh, millenarian movements. I think it might be Dale Allison here. Um, where uh, you can see what is happening in another kind of sociological context and use those models in order to interpret the information that we have uh, in the Gospels and to see how much they conform. Uh, there is a theological continuity between uh, the earthly Jesus, the historical Jesus, and the charismatic Christ, that is the one that was proclaimed or preached by the early Christians, uh, since Jewish biblical patterns of interpretations are still operational. So the first followers of Jesus were Jews. Uh, there, this view that there were these kind of patterns of interpretations uh, that existed um, not only in Jesus' day, but you know, in the few decades afterwards with his disciples, uh, and these things were being utilized to uh, develop the faith of Jesus' followers beyond what it is that. Jesus himself may have preached or proclaimed. Uh, and for the third quest, non-canonical sources are valuable. So whereas in the new quest, that you shouldn't be using non-canonical sources, uh, but in the third quest you could. So like for instance, John Dominic Crossan want to use uh, sayings of Jesus uh, in the Gospel of Thomas as possible sayings that go back to uh, the historical Jesus. So uh, you can look at look at that material. And, and there are other materials that exist that has sayings that are attributed to Jesus and to investigate. Well, maybe, maybe there were these traditions that passed on uh, outside of the Gospels, and these do go back, back to Jesus. So that's a very quick review of some of the uh, major aspects of the historical Jesus quest. And right now, kind of in the day in which we're living here, we're kind of still in this uh, third quest a period, although you have representations of other uh, other quests uh, still around.